So for the past couple of years, I have had the privilege of traveling to universities across the country to watch Alan Alda talk about a dream he has to change the way the best and brightest minds in this country are educated. So let me make two observations. In all deference to the people of Western New York, the Alan Alda fans are a very hardy bunch. About three weeks ago in Vermont, where the temperature was 10 below zero without the wind chill, and there was blowing snow, 750 people came out to see him. So they are loyal Alan Alda fans. The other thing I would tell you is wherever he goes, this is what happens. Somebody gets up to introduce him, and this is the way they inev inev invariably begin. They say, ladies and gentlemen, a person who needs no introduction. We know him. We know him from his 12 years at MASH, his five Emmy Awards, his 45 movies, his two books, his works on Broadway, his bestsellers, his work as a screenwriter, a director. That takes about a half hour, by the way. He does need an introduction. He really does. He needs a brief reintroduction. And that reintroduction starts about eight years ago when he comes to Stony Brook University and he issues a challenge to the president. The president of Stony Brook University then was a woman named Shirley Kenny, who many of you may know. And he told Shirley Kenny that he had been a narrator, a host really, on a television program called Scientific American Reports. And he had traveled across the world interviewing the most brilliant and eminent scientists that we know. And they, they were probing the mysteries of the earth, the poetry of the universe. They had great stories, they're trying to cure cancer. And some of them were very good at explaining this. But others, other scientists, when he tried to put them on camera, really couldn't talk very effectively about what they do, what they know, why it matters. And he said to her, wouldn't it be great if some university in this country could train scientists as they're being educated as scientists to also be great communicators. Don't we need scientists to tell us what they know and what they don't know? Don't we need that so powerfully in this country? And he had talked like this to lots of presidents at lots of universities, and it was the president of Stony Brook who said, we can do this. The result was that about two years later at Stony Brook, I had just arrived, we created the nation's first center in communicating science. Its mission is to train current and future scientists to be able to explain and talk about their work to the lay public, to policymakers, to funders, to colleagues, to students, and do it in a compelling, vivid, clear way. The last five years, we have grown exponentially at this center. We have now trained over 500 PhDs and master's students in the sciences at Stony Brook in a lot of our techniques and methods, which Alan can talk about much better than I can. We have done presentations and done workshops for a thousand working scientists, some of them the top scientists in the country from 75 different institutions. This year, we began training all of the first-year medical students at Stony Brook School of Medicine. And our ambition continues. And on that note, I want to make a very special announcement here tonight. And in order to make that announcement, I need to ask Yaakov Shamash to come up and join me here on the podium. Yaakov? So what we would like to announce tonight is that for the first time, the Allen Alda Center will collaborate with the School of Engineering and begin to introduce communication training to all the future engineers in America. And the second thing I want to announce tonight that might interest you here personally is that we are going to make our training available to technology and science companies on Long Island. And if you want to send your employees and your managers to the Allen Alda Center, we will help train them 
so that they will become better communicators. And so on the way out, if you pick up this brochure about the Allen Alda Center, which will explain a great deal, there is a sheet that will tell you if your company would like to get involved in these activities, how you can do that. And Pat Malone, Pat, where's Pat? Who's representing Stony Brook is the person you can contact and we can talk to you about what the Alda Center can do for you. So ladies and gentlemen, the person who has made all of this possible, Alan Alda. Thank you. Is this? I can't stand podiums. I'm sorry. I can. I, the podium. This is one of the things I try to help scientists understand. When you talk to the people, get as close to them as possible, and look them in the eye, and get comfortable with them. And this is like a fortress to get behind. I mean, most people will not be shooting at me tonight. <laughs> at least not yet. What is, this, I'm, this is a great. Uh, uh, it's a great feeling to be honored by you tonight because this is a very interesting group of people in this room tonight, I think. You are the nexus of science and entrepreneurship where you take science and make it happen in our lives. And that's such a, a powerful combination. I really thank you for what you do. And you know those brilliant, beautiful kids that we saw on the screens a little while ago? What's interesting about them, I talked with them before the evening, and I wanted to understand their work better, and I wanted to understand how they did their work. And this is so interesting to me. They're not only brilliant young scientists, they're also entrepreneurs in a very real way. They're very proactive. You saw the, the mentors that they worked with. I think in every case, they went and found those mentors themselves. They looked them up on the internet. They were doing work that they were interested in. And they sent them emails and they, f they asked if they would be their mentors. They reached out and got the help they need. Isn't that, isn't that, isn't that an image of, in a way, what you do is you reach out and make it happen. And without those mentors, they wouldn't have had the ability to reach the goals that they did, I think. And they're, they're a brilliant bunch of kids. It's so beautiful to see that. So here, here's what we do at, and how it began. You know, I did a program on television, on public television for about 11 years called Scientific American Frontiers. And it was an unusual program because I had conversations with the scientists but they weren't ordinary interviews. We, I didn't know, are you following me with the camera? Is it hard? I keep walking out of your shot. <laughs> okay. I didn't, um, I didn't have a set of questions to ask to scientists. I would just ask them to tell me about their work the way I did with the kids tonight before the evening began. And I, I just asked them more questions until I understood what they were talking about. And if I didn't understand it, I wouldn't let them go. I'd badger them until they made me understand it. Eric Lander, the great gene researcher, was telling me about his work. And I, I couldn't get it until I got so frustrated, I grabbed him by both cheeks and said, Gene, I don't know what you're talking about. Tell me what it's going Eric, and, and he, he, fortunately, he could, you know, he could explain it in another way. But it worked the other way, too. I was in China with this guy, Eric Longping. No, not Eric. It's Eric Lander and Yuen Longping. I'm caught in my memory here. So Yuen Longping was telling me about how he invented hybrid rice, and it was a very complicated thing, but he was telling me in scientific detail, using biological terms they didn't understand. And he said, I can't, tell me again, what do you mean? What are you talking about? Finally, he got so frustrated, he grabbed me by the shirt. He said, Alan, pay attention! <laughs> sort of, sort of a, his, his kind of pedagogy, but... I, I loved doing that program because I got to understand stuff about the universe that I had never heard before. The only problem with it was the producers were trying to kill me during the program. They had me doing these dangerous things. I'm used to sitting and reading a book. They, we were doing a program in Italy 
where we're going to, the producer says, we're going to climb up to the top of Mount Vesuvius now and talk to a scientist up at the top of Mount Vesuvius. I said, I don't, I don't think we ought to do that. <laughs> he said, well, why not? I said, because the story we're doing is about how it could blow at any moment. <laughs> he said, no, 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 don't worry about it. She's up there with all this equipment. She knows exactly what's going on. Don't worry about it. So I walked all the way to the top of Mount Vesuvius, and I'm, I sit next to the scientist, and we look down into this crater, and there are these jets of steam coming out of the crater. And I said, so tell me about this equipment you have. What do you learn from it? She says, oh, not too much. <laughs> I'll tell you, they were trying to kill me. They didn't, you know, we, 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 well, on that same trip to Italy, we were on, in, at the Leaning Tower of Pisa, and I was supposed to go up to the top of the tower and interview a scientist. So I walk in at the bottom of the tower, and the guy who was the curator, the, the scientist who was in charge of the tower, knew me from television, you know, so he was very nice to me. He was explaining everything to me, and we're, we're walking across the, the entryway, and he says, you know, the tower is in very bad shape. If it, if it, if, it, if it's not going to just fall over one day, there's so much pressure on it, it's going to explode from the middle out. <laughs> and we're walking toward the stairs. And I said, I see this sign above the stairs. It says, no one permitted beyond this point. They said, you let people go up to the top? He said, oh, not anymore, but for you, we made an exception. <laughs> But that program was wonderful because the thing that made the, the, the scientists explain their work vividly and clearly and never betray the truth of their science, they never dumbed it down. Even though I was badgering them until they could make me understand it, they kept it true to their science. And the reason was it was a conversation that we had. We were just talking to one another. And when the show was over and I thought, as you heard from Howie, I thought, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could train scientists to communicate while they're learning to be scientists so they would graduate as accomplished scientists and accomplished communicators? And I thought that conversation we had had a quality that was human and interactive. And I remembered where I had learned how to do that, and that was as a young actor when I studied improvisation. And, I, and the thing about improvisation is it's the most important element of it is not that you make things up on the spot or that you're funny. Most people know improvisation from comedy improvisation. But the most basic and most important part of it, and you were talking about making a contact with your customers before, and that's exactly what improvisation does. It puts you in touch with the other person. You're, you're observing the other person. You can't do improv without taking that person in and letting them have an effect on you. So I thought, why don't I try improvising with scientists? And the first experiment I did was at USC in California, and it was with engineering students. I, I, was, I, was, I had to be there for another reason, and I said, while I'm there, how about if you get 20 engineering students and ask them to come in and talk each one to the other 19 about their work, just for two minutes. Then we improvised for three hours. I, there are standard exercises that go back many years that really open you up and make you fixated on the other person. So you get this relationship established. We improvised for three hours, and then this came the tricky part of the experiment. Now, this was going to be a test of whether this idea would work. I said, now, talk about your work again, each of you to the other 19 people. And they each did, and every single one of them got better. The ones who were good to start with got better. The ones who were scared at the beginning got looser and more personal and more clear. And I thought, this is going to work. And so as I went around the country, talking to presidents of universities and trying to get them to change the education a little bit, augmented with communication training, I was beginning to realize we could use the improv as a foundation for this training. And it would be extended, the principles would be, would be engaged with 
at the beginning, but then we would turn it into paying attention not just to the customer, but paying attention to the person reading your paper so that it even works with writing, but it all has to do with what's going on in the mind of the person who's listening to you. We're so good at this. This is what makes us human. I, we, I did a program called The Human Spark about what makes us human. I went around the world and I asked scientists who were experts in this, what is it, what characterizes us as we think we're so much better than the other animals. So what makes it, if we are, what makes us so different? And they all said it's this amazing ability we have to connect with the other person, socialization, to read one another's minds. They call this theory of mind. There's a certain point in the development of a human where they begin to realize, it's around the age of four or so, they begin to realize that other people are thinking things that they're not thinking. That's a big discovery for kids. And as we get older, we start to get good at figuring out what the other person is thinking. You buy a used car, you're thinking about what that guy is thinking as he's selling it to you. <laughs> What's, is he on my side or is he on his side? Does he have his own agenda? What is, what's, what's the look on his face? What's happening in his eyes? What's his body language like? All of that is taken in. It's not just, communication is not just what we say. It's everything about us that gives us a chance to find out what's in the other person's mind and vice versa. So we, we work on that. I, that's, that's what we did with the improvising and it plays into the other things that we do. So one, if we have this amazing ability to socialize, to be connected to other people, and that's what's our greatest strength as humans. Why would we give it up when we're talking about one of the greatest achievements of humankind, which is science? Or in this particular case, engineering. And the, the need for good engineering co communication is extraordinary. There was a study done recently, a, a, a poll taken, survey, and the employers of, of many engineers said that 96% of them said that better communication was either of the utmost importance or very important. And, and like examples, like the, the design engineers and the architects in a big building firm couldn't, couldn't understand one another. This is a bad situation. The building's going up. You know, I wouldn't want to cross a bridge built on faith you got to have strong communication going on. The, a big, a worldwide cosmetic company needed the scientists to explain to the board what the FDA considerations were for their product, for the, re, the, the research that went into the product. They had a great difficulty explaining to the board something that's fundamentally important to the bottom line of that company. So there's a tremendous need for it. But how come we give up this chance to make the contact? And I don't think we mean to give it up. I think we can't help giving up this chance to make contact because of something that a couple of people a few decades ago called the curse of knowledge. The curse of knowledge, that's a funny phrase. Why would knowledge be a curse? It's a curse when you know something so deeply and in such complexity that you can't remember what it's like not to know it, and you start talking in jargon to the person you want to understand you when they don't get it, and you don't understand that they don't get it because it makes perfect sense to you, because you understand, you've studied it's your life 20, 30 years. Of course you understand it, but the other person doesn't get it, and you have the curse of knowledge. Let me show, let me show you a little bit what I mean. You want to give me an, do an experiment with you? are relatively brave. Come on up, Omid. Come on. Hi. What's your name? Sue. J Sue. I thought you said Jill. I'm sorry. Sue. Uh, come on. This is good. Okay. I'm going to show you something. These are three songs. They're songs that most people know. Don't say anything out loud. Just just look at it, and and pick one of those out. Okay, don't, don't tell me. Oh. Okay, you got it? Okay. Now, what you're going to do is you're going to tap out that song 
without making any musical sounds. All I want to hear is tapping. For, and, and if it, for instance, if the song were Oh Susanna, it's not Oh Susanna, but if it were Oh Susanna, you would tap like Oh Susanna, but not, no singing, just the tapping. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. No humming either. Okay. <laughs> okay, so are you ready for your song? Uh, what, it's a, these are all well-known songs. Um, what, how many people do you think will get it? What, what will be able to identify the song? What, what percentage of people? Um, I'd say 60%. 60%, okay. Can you hear that tap? You can hear that okay? Go ahead. All right, now don't say anything if you think you know. Raise your hand if you think you know what it is. Well, one, two, three, four, five, six. Not quite 60%. Uh, what was it? God bless America. God bless America. Okay, how many people who thought you got it really were right? One, two, three. Four, five, six. That's about about the same number. That's very good. That's excellent. Thank you. I have hummed. No, <laughs> she says I should have hummed. That's that's terrific. Now here's the thing. Don't feel bad because even though you thought sixty percent might get it, most people say they think eighty percent of the audience will get it. And here's what's happening. You had the melody in your head when you were tapping. That was, you were cursed by the knowledge of that melody. The tapping is just the bare facts. The melody is the meaning and the importance to the other person. Don't hold that back when you're explaining something complex. Let them hear the melody too. There's no sense in sticking with the curse of knowledge if you don't have to. Sing the melody, you know? I didn't let you, and you would have done great if you sang the melody. When I, if, I sang, if I sang God Bless America, most people would know what the song was. <laughs> most of them. You, you, don't forget that if you're interested in our working with you, look at that brochure. We would love to work with you because we want to see science made clear. We want engineering to be made clear to the people, not only in the public, but the colleagues, the people, fellow scientists need to be able to understand one another better. So much more is being done through collaboration across disciplines. And if the disciplines can't understand each other, we're all in trouble. So this is a wonderful evening that, that you've given us a chance to tell you about the, the brilliant people that the, all the Center for Communicating Science, they're the ones you're really congratulating tonight. And I thank you on behalf of all of us for your kind attention to this group. Thank you. Right? Remains great. Alan Alda, thank you so much. Great, great, great insights. We're delighted that you were here.